There's a real cool club on the other side of town where the real cool kids gotta sit around and talk bad about the other kids. Yeah, it's a real cool club and you're not part of it. Box, Book Three, Chapter Five. Chapter Five, in which semi-famous flies to Berkeley to re-establish a connection with Doc Records. Thomas Mann, Thomas Mann, yes, Thomas Mann. No, I guess I don't know from what he actually died. The old fellow sitting next to you on the plane is a calm, friendly sort. He is a retired surgeon, a very literary surgeon, probably minored in literature. Perhaps he wanted to be a writer or a teacher, or at least he romanticized and entertained the idea. Now he travels around the world searching through hospital documents, personal diaries, and file cabinets in small villages and big cities. He is hired by biogra- he is hired by biographers to uncover the precise, truthful deaths of literary giants and minor historic figures worthy of books written about them. Thomas Mann, an amazingly prolific author of the early twentieth century, was also known for his astounding ability to drink much alcohol, but his death had never been linked directly to alcoholism. This man sitting next to you proved it to be more than possible. This new information made itself known to the man next to you from ordinary medical records, commonplace x-rays, and handwritten charts of Thomas Mann's right leg. It's rather fascinating. He has uncovered information about Edgar Allan Poe, Hemingway, and many, many others, or so he says. Death does not put a black mark of finality in anyone's personal history. As long as someone thinks, talks, writes, invents, or accidentally stumbles upon information about the aforementioned anyone, no part of the past is unalterable. The information may not appear consequential to any immense or minuscule social circle, but it's malleable nonetheless. I actually really like this guy and, uh, and found it all very fascinating. The literary surgeon and you eventually end up talking about the band, You tell him that you are headed to California to work out the details of a new contract for your next record. He's impressed, but it's easy to impress someone who doesn't know much about modern pop music. Everybody has a record out these days. A musician doesn't even have to have a band, or know how to play an instrument, or have any talents whatsoever to record and produce a record. But you don't tell him this, so he is still impressed. The conversation subsides. You would like to continue. He's immensely interesting, and he thoroughly engrosses your attention. But you're not very good at reviving subsiding conversations. They seem to subside for a reason, and it's very easy to let it go at that. You go back to reading the book that initiated the conversation. The title of the book is Hunger, written by Knut Hamsen, an author from Norway. He died of a non-specific old age disease. Someone probably researched this thoroughly. But dying of old age is hard to make intriguing. He was blacklisted, though, for many years because of his affiliation with the Nazis, which is an intriguing death in its own respect, or lack of respect thereof. Parentheses. Later you looked up a biography online about Thomas Mann, and it said that he died when he was 80 years old. This made you wonder whether this old fellow on the plane had lied to you, 
or if you misunderstood what author he was talking about, or if he thought dying at 80 was an early enough death to be blamed on alcohol, unparentheses. Mr. Famous, across the aisle from you, is in the midst of a mystery crime novel by Jim Thompson. He inhales these novels. This is the last of Thompson's novels for Franklin. He has read all the others. He'll have to reach into his ever-growing pile of books that sits in his living room soon to find a new author. Muddle is sitting next to Franklin. He is reading the same book, just a few chapters behind. He won't need to find another author any time soon, but he may choose to, purely out of the capriciousness purely out of capriciousness. Muddle has only read two or three other books by Jim Thompson. You have never read a, you have never read a single book by Jim Thompson. The one they are both reading right now is currently on a waiting list in your head. Crime novels have a special yet limited amount of shelf space in your head. You grab books from that area, area only during the times in your life when you want nothing more than to be thousands of miles away from reality. Even fantasy and science fiction novels seem to put you in closer touch with reality than crime novels. You don't know why this is so, but it is undoubtedly, but it undoubtedly is quite true. Uh, actually, the the one time uh, I did read a lot of crime novels, but they were more the more pulp fictiony than uh, Jim Thompson was the uh, uh, Mickey Spillane novels. My friend Peter Flynn was a huge fan of that. Whenever he got tired of. Uh, literature, you know, like Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, uh, he used to read a lot of that, you know, Kafka, um, he would resort, resort to, uh, <laughs> Mickey Splane novels. Anyway, so, Dredd is two rows back, and one aisle across from you. He is talking to a woman about the Beatles' White Album. He has an infinite amount of information to impart. His dad is a Beatles fanatic, and Dredd has inherited his father's love for music and imparting the trivial. Dredd will talk for hours about the trivial. This trip from Chicago to California has been paid for by Duck Records. Oh, look, I changed it from an exclamation point to a to a, a exclamation point. So it's Duck Records. Uh, earlier in the book, I had it as Duck Records. <laughs> I don't know which one I meant. I think probably the exclamation point was supposed to be the one. Uh, so there's a grammar mistake. Well, that's actually kind of a nice one, though, to change it to. Because <laughs> uh, it should have been reversed, maybe questioning more near the end of Lookout and the exclamation uh, at the beginning. Anyway, the expenses made the current foursome feel a little special. Eight hours touring, eight years touring in the band, and this is the first time a trip to California or anywhere has not come out of your own pocket. And it's a trip that takes less than 44 hours. How strange and unfamiliar. Going to California without losing two days in the process is definitely a first. There is even a high-rise hotel waiting for you at the other end. The Matamac Attack Hotel, or something nothing at all similar. The hotel is overbooked when you get there. No rooms available. When you hear the desk manager announce this to the four of you with a devastating yet mildly executed indifference, the situation begins to coat itself in a more realistic Familiar shade of befuddlement accentuated with spots of inevitability. Luckily, there is a sister hotel two streets down and on the left with one or two available rooms. The desk manager begins to make arrangements. He shuffles around a few pieces of paper, takes a look at his computer screen, and presses a few keys on his keyboard. What are you men doing in Berkeley? You tell him that you are in a band. And with a sudden boost of amazement, he says, I thought so. What band? And you tell him, we're in a band called Semi-Famous. His face ascends into a deep blankness as if frozen. You look around the room to see if I am about to make an appearance. Has the scenery stopped moving? Are the walls peeling? No. People are still rushing about with luggage, hippies in business suits and tourists with cameras. He hasn't heard of the band, and now he is not quite sure how to react. He doesn't want to offend you. We're a punk band underground music thing. It's not a big deal if you don't know who we are. It happens all the time. His expression doesn't change much. Oh. We have records out. He responds with the smallest amount of enthusiasm, as if it pains him to reach such a low plateau. Oh. He is not impressed, and this time you sort of wanted him to be impressed. The Jekyll and Hydeness of your own vanity shocks you for a moment. 
After everything you guys have been through, recording the last record without knowing for sure if the band members wouldn't kill each other, and not knowing if a label even wanted to put out the record, Franklin and you paid for the album's recording yourselves, not wanting to be affected by the pressure of a label. But there's no, but there's no way that the two of you can survive long with these those bills over your heads, unpaid by the hopeful advance from Duck Records. There it goes back to Duck. Duck Records? The desk manager sees musicians wandering through the hotel lobby every day. He would only be impressed by high-priority mainstream name recognition. You can tell them that you have some friends that are famous, very famous, million-dollar famous, but that seems a little too pathetic. And in some ways, it sends out a message that, without a complete understanding of what your band is about, takes on the appearance of failure. Or even worse than failure, mediocrity. You say nothing. You stare at each other for a moment. Then he whips out a pad of paper and pen. Is he about to ask you for an autograph? There doesn't seem to be any reason for him to want one. Some day it may have value. He could be taking the future into consideration, like collecting comic books with an eye on the whims of popularity or the increasing price of antiquity. He rips a piece of paper from the pad, presses the tip of the pen against the surface, and begins drawing intersecting lines. He is drawing a map that explains how to get to the hotel that is just two streets down and on the left. Not only does he lack admiration for the band, but he has just now lumped you in the mountain-high pile of stereotyped artists and musicians who have no sense of direction. This does offend you. The plane begins to shake, bumping up and down. Your cup of coke spills onto your lap. You look out the window of the plane. I am peeping inwards, the tips of my fingers sticking to the the glass like miniature suction cups. We need to get back soon! You are not sure what I just said. The split second you heard my voice, you began to plunge yourself into a self-induced surreal coma, pulling the plane apart, stretching the metal until it snaps to pieces, tossing your unbreakable body up into the clouds, freezing for a moment at a record high altitude left unrecorded. Then you sent yourself tumbling headfirst downward through the clouds, through miles of atmosphere, and then finally you tear through the tin roof of a trailer in Wyoming. Your body thuds against the carpeted metal. Your hand lays on a stray fork sending it spiraling through space, then sticking in the canvas forehead of a bearded man seated comfortably in a wooden frame on the wall. This is uh, this actually reminds me, and this is, this is definitely because I was influenced by uh, Salman Rushdie's uh, Satanic Verses. I might have mentioned that earlier in the book, uh, but that's that, that just goes to show you. That's t- almost directly right out of, um, out of his book. Pause. A happy cat- catastrophic silence. And then you hear from over your woundless shoulder, What the hell is this? You look to your left, past the yellow and white, checkered linoleum kitchen table above the, above the black and white television with a handmade tinfoil antenna, through the dark stains and layers of dust on the window. I am clinging to the outer surface of the glass, my hair continuously snapping back and forth in the wind like a herd of chained leather whips. The clouds pass by at an incredible rate. I was happy just to walk back to the club. You have something else in mind. It's a small trailer park in Wyoming, you say as you try to stand up. Or it's a cozy one-room apartment flying over a small trailer park in Wyoming. I'm not sure right now. You can't move freely. You can't get your back off, off, back off the ground. You are seat-belted to the wall-to-wall carpeting. What are you doing here? Uh, I don't know. Well, I have some ideas. As I say this, the room begins to shrink in around you until it is pressed up against your arms. The window disappears, and in its place, a small wooden panel slides open. Tell me, my son. I don't have anything to confess. The wall between us pulls inwards. It forces your body through the small wooden opening. You are sitting on the edge of a couch. I am spinning around in a leather chair with my feet and hands in the air. I am having a very good time. Would you like to lie down? No. I stop spinning. The room vanishes. We are sitting face to face in a plain wooden folding... We are sitting face to face in plain wooden folding chairs. I lean in toward you. It's dead. 
I lean back in my chair, having said my piece. I tap my finger on my knee and wait for a response. Uh, what's dead? Look around you. I wave my hand in no particular direction. You take a look around. Through a window that fills the entire right side of your peripheral vision, you can see Dread talking without barely moving his lips, his palm pressed up against his jaw, trivializing and trivializing. He begins to recede into the distance, his airplane seat carrying him higher and farther away, gyrating with no up or down, all the while talking about the Beatles in relation to his father and himself. Above you, through a skylight opening up into a thick, endless black space, you can make out the embossed figures of Mr. Famous and Muddle, belted into the same seat. The seat and their bodies begin to twist and stretch. They're yelling, pointing fingers, slapping foreheads, cursing one another, grasping for each other's arms, holding on tight. The bones in their fingers crack, their skin folds over itself, fusing together like striped colored taffy. The connection thins under the stress. They catapult upward, each holding the stretched bloodied fingers of the other. And where are you? I don't know. Where are you? In Wyoming? No. Boston. Not now. Why do I have to know where, where I am? All I want to do is look on, read on, watch the pictures fly by, watch the years cascade in front of me in no particular order. Watch them randomly create back-to-back -back awe-inspiring, mind-numbing, tedious, fluorescent colors, gritty and smooth textures as they collide and rub up against each other. I want to reach out and curiously touch one every now and then, setting this chaos on a new course. Is this how you define meaning? Pause. Do you know what he actually died from? Who? Thomas Mann. Thomas Mann? Yes, Thomas Mann. That is end of chapter five. And I will read chapter six soon. <laughs> chapter six, in which the meeting with Lester goes horribly for all parties involved. In which the meeting with Lester goes horribly for all parties involved. Involved. <laughs> All right, here we go. The last time semi-famous, the last time semi-famous was through California visiting Duck Records. The entire business was run from the filthy, unkempt living room of Lester. Records were stacked up against stereo speakers, lamps, a humidifier, a refrigerator, a bed covered with zines, manila folders, and underwear. Now the label is run from a magnificent second-floor office space with an atrium that casts beautiful rays of sunshine and sprightly shadows across 1,200 square feet of California progress. The office is filled with workstations, vibrant blue carpeting, and wall-to-wall -wall glossy posters of duck bands, past and present. It is not on par with the Warner Brothers musical division or the Playboy Mansion, but for a handful of bands sending themselves across the country in minivans, pintos, and Malibus, walking down sidewalks in Berkeley, passing by beggars and thinking, this could be me someday, stopping at playgrounds to swing on swings, jumping from monkey bars to monkey bars, breaking into campus buildings and launching boxes and boxes of paper planes onto unsuspecting students. Uh, that's uh, the first one in the playing in the, uh, in the playground was actually a reference to uh, Jawbreaker. We did that with Jawbreaker uh, I th when we were in San Francisco. And the second one is a reference to, uh, to uh, Jeff Ott, who, uh, who brought us to the top of this building on the campus and uh, and we started throwing like a box of paper planes over the edge, and he did something really dangerous. <laughs> anyway, so we'll keep going on. Where am I? Lost. Okay. Uh, breaking into campus buildings and launching boxes and boxes of paper planes onto unsuspecting students, driving from town to town, not knowing if they will have enough money to buy gas to get to the next stop, eating microwave burritos, sleeping on the hoods of cars, having the audacity to steal baby remains from graves, going to courts and prisons, befriending crazy hippies with mysterious funds, and letting these hippies help to cal calibrate the fate of their bands while eating pizza by the slice. 
The office was quite a large and unexpected change of events. Actually, a slow burn. But when you are absent from a location for a while and then return, the memories can cause you to feel as if years were yesterdays. That's a good line. I like that. I'm going to say it again. Actually, a slow burn. When you are absent from a location for a while and then return, the memories can cause you to feel as if years were yesterdays. Ah, how true. Anyway, BC Pills back catalog had allowed Duck Records to hire a full-time staff and rent an office with multiple rooms and cubicles. The profits from Interrogation League, uh, Operation Ivy, had brought them computers and scanners. The back catalog sales of semi-famous Mr. Rogers Delusion, of course, Mr. Uh, T. Experience, Swindle Parlor, that's uh, Crimshine, The Flaming Faggots, The Queers, and a few others had allowed Duck Records to buy paper clips, a couple pairs of scissors, and a nice erasable full-color wall calendar. Actually, it bought much more than that, but it didn't seem like those employees felt that way. There's a sturdy, ceiling-high wooden cabinet positioned in front of and blocking the only derivatives poster used to decorate this establishment. The derivatives may have made enough of a profit to pay for that deep appreciation. From the entrance clear to the back fire exit, the four of you pass employees scatter to the left and right, typing letters and talking on phones. Each alternative corporate young adult takes their turn looking up and smiling. Hi, guys. Well, look who's here. A few of the smiles and greetings are actually genuine, or at least come from a place of momentary bemusement. The air is thick with deliberation. The flexible rules of a recent staff meeting linger, resonate, manifest in loosely improvised, partially contrived dialogue and anecdotes. How is the flight? It's a pleasure to have you guys here, finally. Do you need something to drink or eat? Excuse the mess. We're a little busy right now. Why don't you take a look around? Have you done anything interesting in town yet? At last, Semi-Famous is here. Now the story is complete. The attention feels weird, so all four band members quickly move to the back of the office space and dart into Lester's office and wait for him to emerge from a meeting of the three head honchos. The four of you stand in the middle of Lester's office, tired, uncomfortable, bumping into each other like cattle in an elevator. Lester walks in with a cherry with a cherry sucker in his mouth and no socks or shoes on his feet. He grins. He walks past the four of you and sits, behi- sits himself behind a mid-sized desk with a mid-sized computer monitor, taking up the mid-section of the mid-sized desk. He leans back in a gray, mid-sized, comfy, small business swirling chair and puts his toes upon the surface of the mid-sized desk. Mr. Famous, it's, that, you know, that reminds me that... uh. Uh, in general, with my writing, it drives me crazy sometimes because it takes so long. I tend not to try to use words uh, or like uh, adjectives or nouns over over again, and definitely not in the same sentence. Uh, so whenever I do, it usually means something. So of course, I'm making making fun of uh, a company being midsize and acting like it's you know big business. Uh, but anyway, Mister Famous sits down on the fluffy white couch. You sit next to him on the right. Dredd sits on his left. Muddle stands in the center of the room with his arms folded across his chest, with his face lowered to the ground. Muddle looks from one wall to the other for a chair in which to sit. After a few moments, he walks over to the threesome on the couch and squeezes himself up against Dredd and the dirty, white, fluffy armrest. Mr. Famous puts his arms around you and Dredd. He touches Muddle's shoulder with the tips of his fingers. Muddle looks over the heads of you and Dredd. He stares briefly at Franklin. He is not amused. He is cranky and a bit confused about why he is here. He shrugs his shoulders a small degree to the right. The very tips of Mr. Famous's fingers tap out senseless, rhythmic Morris code on the edge of Muddle's shoulder blade before they leap off and land playfully on the back of the fluffy white, fluffy white couch. The meeting begins. We have been crunching numbers, Franklin, and it is impossible for us to give you an advance. We just don't do things like that around here. Well, which is it? What do you mean? Is it that you don't do things around here? Is it that you don't do those things around here? 
Or is it that you don't have the money? We don't have the money, and we, do don't, and we don't do that here. No advances. Then we take our record elsewhere. Is it really that important that you get an advance? Yes, for many reasons. We deserve the cash up front, we need the cash up front, and we need from you trust. We believe we are taking a risk staying with this label whenever, when every other band is signing to a major, and we want you to support our decision by taking a risk and advancing us 50 grand. You heard the record, you know it is great, and you know it'll sell. So what kind of fucking risk is that anyway? So that's, that's uh, Mr. Fame, Franklin Famous, or you know Ben saying that. That's kind of pretty close to something he did say. Lester looks down at some papers scattered on the desk. You watch him carefully, being an accountant yourself, and you can tell that he isn't really doing anything. All the numbers had been figured out in advance at the meeting he just stepped out of. He is playing a game, and as always, you and Franklin go straight to the truth and have to wait there at the tr- as wait there as the truth wait what what is it what did I say I know what I'm trying to say but let's see if I wrote it right wait there at the truth for the other player to drop the game and join okay yeah yeah let me say that again he is playing a game and as always you and Franklin go straight to the truth and have to wait there at the truth for the other player to drop the game and join you there According to my numbers, we can only afford 30 grand. Well, according to my ass, you're a fucking liar. Why should we take this risk when we don't even know if you're going to tour? How do you know we won't tour? And then Dredd speaks out. I'm never torn again. You send him a look that says, Shut up, you fool. I don't believe a word you are saying, and you're not helping. Then everything seems to go off track, and you are not quite sure why. Franklin says, We have done some reorganizing. We have made some changes, and touring is one of the things we make reconsider. We have some unifying ideas to help cultivate our audience. We are taking some aspects from the derivatives and applying them to semi-famous to help keep the audience we may have gained on the BC Pills tour. I want to take a promo photo for the record where we are all uniformly dressed in jeans and black leather jackets. And you can't help but speak out. What the hell are you talking about? I will never wear jeans and a leather jacket. I don't wear jeans. I hate jeans. Semi-famous is about individual personalities. Later that night, Dredd will tell you that he thought Franklin was joking, but you are not so sure. Franklin looks at you, and then he looks over at Dredd, and then leans forward and looks at Muddle. Lester... I think the band needs to talk about a few things. Can we use your office for a while and get back to you? Sure. Lester walks out and shuts the door behind him. Franklin stands up from the couch. You, Muddle, and Dread slide together. Okay, boys, out with it. I am not touring, Muddle mumbles. Can you take your goddamn hand away from your mouth when you're talking? I can't understand a word you are saying. This is one of the top annoyances for Franklin. This is one of the top annoyances for Franklin. Jesus, how many times do I have to tell you that? I'm just saying that we hated touring, right? Muddle? Isn't that right, Franklin? And you say, I just don't believe you, Dredd. I know that you love touring, and I just don't believe that you will never tour. I think you are just saying that because you think that that that, that is what Muddle and Franklin want to hear. Or maybe you just don't want to tour with them again. And then Muddle says, I don't want to tour either. This shocks you slightly. It is not that Dredd doesn't want to tour that shocks you, but that he is actually speaking up at all. And I don't believe you either, although it is a bit more realistic. I just don't think you guys are being honest with yourselves. Well, whether we fucking tour or not should not affect what we are here for. Franklin recently quit smoking, so he takes a flavored toothpick out of his pocket and pops it into his mouth, and then continues, They have the money, we deserve the money, and we are going to get the money. This is weird. I don't know if this is, uh, my my memory's not as good anymore now, but the memory I, I always remember, I used to always talk about, is that Larry asked Ben to leave the room when we talked about touring, because I was confused 
that those two guys didn't want to tour, and I thought they were just saying it because of Ben. Maybe that comes later. I don't know. But that's actually what really happened. Uh, I don't know who was saying this. I don't like this feeling here at all, and I'm not just talking about Lester. Between us, too. If we don't get the 50 grand, let's just call it off and look elsewhere. Oh, that was uh, that was Ben. No, that was me. Let me say it again. I don't like this feeling. I don't like this feeling here at all. And I'm not just talking about Lester. Between us, too. If we don't get the 50 grand, let's just call it off and look elsewhere. Is that what you really think, Bughead? Is that really what you think? Are you willing to take that risk with your money and mine? Because that's what I think we should do. Because that's what I think we should do. Yes, I think that that is what I think. And what do the other two think? Franklin looks at Muddle and Dread. They both shrug their shoulders. And that decides it. Lester is called back into the office. So, is 30 grand good for all of you? Nope. But what do the other boys think? Do you think they should have a say? They do have a say, Lester. Don't go trying to cause trouble. Well, before I make my decision, I want you, Franklin, to leave the room. And let me talk to the rest of the band. Oh, see, so it's a, I don't know if that's the right circumstances, but anyway, here. Whatever you want, old man. Franklin leaves the room and shuts the door behind him. You are not such a big fan of Lester. You don't hate him. You just don't trust him. So out with it, guys. What's really going on? And you say, well, what is really going on, Lester, is, we want, is that we want you to take the risk that we have already taken. I know you have the money. And we all know the record will make that money back, so we want it now. And what about touring? I hate touring. I don't want to tour. I don't want to tour either. The repetitiveness of this sore subject catches you off guard, and you lash out. Oh, well, maybe this is more accurate to what happened. I didn't, yeah, didn't know these two things happened together, but that's possible. Anyway, I say... I don't believe this damn conversation. I know that you are both saying that because you don't want Franklin to wrap his tongue around your bodies and squeeze the life out of you. You just don't want... You just don't want to tour with him. Admit it. Admit it. You don't want to tour with him. They do not say anything. Lester, it doesn't matter what I or they think. If we tour, it will be a decision Franklin makes. And even if we don't tour, this album will sell at least 30,000 records automatically without a single tour. You know that. Franklin! Lester calls him back into the room. Franklin walks back in and squeezes back onto the couch. 30 grand, take it or leave it. Franklin takes a toothpick out of his mouth. We'll leave it. The four of you get up and walk out of the office and walk silently past the staff. Before exiting, you turn around and say to Lester, Thanks for the tickets in the hotel. End of chapter six. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a fairly accurate. Once again, it's not all the, the real dialogue that we had said, but the, the intentions of each person, I think I matched that pretty well. I think I spent a lot of time on this because it was a big deal to me. And I wanted to show that I was having conflict with the other three that were in the Riverdales, but that also we were equal in our conflict that we were having with Larry at the time. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Take all my cares away.